Oh, yes. Yeah, we do just because we uh, record it for. Uh, Thank you to the committee for the opportunity. So, yeah. so um, this is just an outline. I, I've shared my uh, slides with uh, presentation with Jeff this morning, so hopefully you communicate them to you. But this is sort of an outline of the um, the three lectures that I'm going to I'm going to give actually. So lecture one is really just a, maybe say it's a or a warmer in the sense that, you know, we're going to try and get you a feel, a feel um, for rotation and mainly by you know, doing a simple overview of um, some of the celestial objects uh, known to be influenced uh, uh, by buoyancy driven flows and under the strong influence or constraint of rotation. I'll discuss some of the uh, energetics, waves and balances in this lecture. So you know, I think so we've had a few lectures last week that's covered some of this territory. So some of it will be familiar to you. Um, in lecture two, we'll get into sort of the topic of rotating convection. I think so there we'll sort of take a, a, a tour through uh, linear stability uh, theory, and we're going to see what we can glean from it, actually. So it turns out if you look at linear stability theory, especially in the limits of strong rotational constraint, the asymptotic limit, a low Rossby number, it turns out there's a lot there that can actually show you how to uh, proceed to what I call a strongly nonlinear uh, theory, which leads to the second point here for lecture number two, which is going to be uh, a discussion and a derivation of non hydrostatic quasi -ge uh, geostrophy. Now, those two words don't typically go together in the standard textbook, but the textbooks, but you know, I'll show that you know, this is a, a an appropriate uh, paradigm to really uh, analyze uh, strongly rotating convective convective flows. So I'll derive that. And it turns out these things will have some nice analytic solutions, strongly nonlinear analytic solutions, and yeah, which actually form a skeleton for configuration space and they actually guide our understanding 
for uh, when we do simulations of turbulent rotating convection. And lecture three, I'll just get into that. You know, we'll look at, we'll start looking at some of our work and, and simulations of this, what I call the non-hydrostatic uh, QG, QG, QG equations. We'll assess how it holds up with experiments with my collaborators who are experimentalists and those who do DNS. And then I'll end with some comments and broader, broader views yeah, from that. Okay. Okay, so I'll just go through sort of like a tour of some of these objects that we know that are um, influenced by rotation. We saw this last week in Srinivasan's talk, you know, one of the ones close by us is the sun. And we've known since the time of Galileo observations of the surface of the sun that it is rotating and it is differentially, differentially rotating. And you can get some nice images here from the Galileo project, which is uh, referenced down there. Um, Here's a stock picture, Srinivasan had it, of the sun. I'll put it up as well, just to, as a refresher and a, a reminder. So we know, you know, it's 700 megameters in radius, and we know it has a nuclear burning core where it generates luminous photonic uh, energy that radiates out uh, through uh, the radia radiation zone via diffusive processes. But ultimately, when you get to the outer one third of, of the, solar, the solar interior, we get to the convection zone. And as uh, she, uh, Professor Srinivasan indicated, this is an area where you know, we can't carry the diffusive flux luminously, so we get buoyantly driven convection. Okay, and as he pointed out, this is sort of, this is a schematic of overturning motions, actually. It's not perhaps the reality, and I mentioned uh, what's really happening in terms of global overturning, uh, overturning flows in the sun. So, we can get an idea from theory and observation uh, of the, the interior, the, inter the interior structure of the sun. In fact, you know the helioseismology, which is you know, uh, um, an inference, you know, acoustic inferences. Uh, the sun on its surface has very vigorous uh, convective motions in granulation, so given a kilometer per second, and they generate acoustic waves. And these acoustic waves ring throughout the sun. And helioseismologists can use these acoustic waves to infer that as these waves travel through the interior, uh, yeah, the, the structure, the, the inner structure of the sun. So we know, uh, oh, I should go back there past that. We know that. So, so we know that one of the successes of that is actually um, in the, finding the differential rotation rate uh, throughout uh, the interior of the sun. And we know that it's rotating rapidly at the equator uh, around about 25 days and, and about 30, 30, 32, 33 days at, at the pole. And what helioseismology has done is actually shows that these, this radio, this differential radio rotating profile on the surface of the sun actually permeates radially, the structure radially through the convection zone to the base and then before it enters solid body rotation uh, in the interior. And if it's a rapidly if it was a rapidly rotating object, one would expect these contours to be on axial lines. And as a consequence of convection in the outer third, um, we have yeah, convection. We have we have an angular momentum transport redistribution by convection that gives this kind of radial uh, radial line radial line structure. And we know convection in you know, the sun of the interior is an electrically conducting. Uh, conducting plasma. So uh, we also know that through convection and, and rotation, it manages to generate, generate a magnetic field. And we've, we've seen this already. This, so we, we, as Galileo observed, you know, this can be pretty vigorous in terms of uh, eruptions, in terms of sub sunspots and prominences at the surface, at the surface of the sun. This takes a, uh, a 22 year cycle. So we have a regular, it's a regular oscillator in the sense that the magnetic field in the surface of the sun repeats itself in its activity every 11 years with pole, with reversal of the polarity of the sunspots every, every 22 years. So we have things where you have sunspot maxima starting the high equator. And as we go on in time, the sunspots migrate, the emergence of migrates to, migrates to the, the, the equator. And uh, this speculation, I know that in uh, last week's lecture, uh, uh, Professor Srinivasan actually wrote up the Rossby number of the sun was order one and greater, but there's actually speculation within this object about the importance 
the importance of rotation in this object. So, and that, that goes with, <coughs> that goes really with the understanding or trying to view uh, structures such as a differential rotation profile in the sun. I've talked about these giant cells or giant, giant cells in the solar, in, 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 in the interior of the sun. They had never been observed. And one of the things there is that if the sun is a rapidly rotating planet, one of the things our research is saying is that those such motions, uh, you know, it's, um, this, such motions are really due to non-rotating profiles. And we can't, you know, then heliosismology has not observed them yet. So this is really one of the things that we can certainly uh, argue for. Now, we see that you can see that these solar oscillations, as I say here, they're, they're, they're chaotic overtones. So it's not, it's a regular size cycle, but it also has uh, periods of, of uh, periods of uh, quiescence, it's not on this. If you go back, you know, you can think, see things like the more the more the, the more the minima actually on there. So this is, so it's a complicated, you know, it's a complicated, it's a complicated object. Uh, in a, it's a complicated object. And, you know, we'll talk about how rotation is important or we get into that, uh, how, how important rotation is. Okay. So let's go to, um, giant planet. So we know these things are also um, uh, objects that are influenced by uh, rotation. So if we look at the Jovian planets, you know, here's Jupiter here. We know that it's pretty much a hydrogen, hydrogen helium based planet, as is Saturn. And it has an interior of metallic hydrogen deep in the interior and molecular hydrogen uh, in the outer regions. And it's, you know, it's got a strong internal source that drives correct convection throughout the interior, this region and, 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 and the upper regions as well. Whereas in the ice giants, Uranus and, and Neptune, um, different makeup in terms that they have uh, more heavier elements in them, methane, methane, oxygen that make them up. But we know these are rapid rotators, okay? so. Um, Jupiter, Saturn, on the one period is in the order of uh, uh, 10 hours, and uh, new Uranus and Neptune going 15 or 16, 16 hours. And we, can, we know the consequence of, of rapid rotation. One can see that, observe that, much like you can observe the differential rotation pattern on the, the surface of the sun. It's more striking here that one can see that as a consequence of, 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 of rotation and buoyantly driven or buoyantly driven convection in the interior, we see a, strike, a striking uh, pattern on the surface of these planets in the form of these zonal winds. So these are alternating east-west uh, east -west jets <laughs> that start at the equator and diminish as you go through the pole. You can see on the order of 100 meters per second, you know, all of these things. And they're quite varied. You can see that if you're looking at the uh, Jupiter and Saturn, they have very strong prograde jets that alternate back, whereas the ice giants has a, a strong has strong retrograde jets, and that's sort of not sort of under, un, understood. But you know, again, it's got to be through the influence of convection and rotation if it's deep. Now we know these we know that these jets are quite deep um, for, through um, recent. Um, uh, uh, the recent Juno mission, which is able to sort of uh, measure sort of the gravitational anomaly, anomaly of, 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 these, of these planets, Jupiter in particular. And they actually can uh, invert and show that these jets actually propagate quite far down, all the way down to the molecular uh, <coughs> uh, hydrogen region. So that makes it sort of a few thousand, a few thousand kilometers. And then, then no detection below that. And it's believed that below that where we have metallic hydrogen uh, magnetic drag that kind of wipes out the process for, for generating for generating such jets. And I put here in the bottom here, this is going to some of the earliest sort of simulations of looking at convection in a rotating layer. So it's sort of heated from below, cool from above, rotating rapidly in a spherical geometry. And this is a sort of a nature paper by Heimper et al. showing that yes, you know, in, at least in numerics, you can begin to start seeing these uh, the formation of these sort of jet like structure. Okay, but we're a long way off. What's, what's our sort of characterized from there? This is a long way off from that. You know, you can see you can get the crude jets, but none of the none of the complicated uh, vertical vertical structures are arising in the simulations. The simulations are still quite a quite a quite a long way, kind of long way a long way off. And 
more recently, in fact, was just sort of exciting from sort of observations of Juno as well. When you look at the poles of these giant planets, you see some also some very striking features. So here at the north and south poles of, of Jupiter, Juno measured, you know, actually observed these uh, cyclonic, cyclonic gyras. Okay, so you've got eight on the top surrounding a, a, a core, so a kind of core, and five on the bottom and at the south, at the south, at south pole. And these were, okay, quite you know, obviously very persistent. And they also are believed to be, um, believed to be uh, driven by uh, convection or moist convection. There's recent articles uh, given here where they show that the underlying driving of, of these of these vortical flows are you know can be can be can be motivated to uh, convective processes and I have some more to say about that in when, in, the, in the, my uh, lecture on Friday when we sort of look at the, the the driving processes in rotating in rotating in you know, rotating convection and you can also see it in um, you can also see it you know Saturn is obviously similar but also strikingly strikingly different at the poles yes so so these are these are probably a few thousand, 3,000 kilometers, three to 5,000 kilometers wide and deep, probably on the same order, deep, you know, 3,000 kilometers, 3,000 kilometers deep. Okay, and you can see, of course, these are similar planets but have very striking different features. So Saturn has this, you know, hexagon pattern at the bottom, basically very different from Jupiter. Open question as to why, you know, so some objects so similar give such strikingly different uh, ob uh, ob observables. Yes? So that's a good question. Well, right now, this is some of the first observations. So, you know, you could upset about the great red spot. Yeah, it's steady state changing the spine. So this is what they observe. They haven't observed that these things are, are changing right now. So this is the first observation of it. So since the Juno missions go in, it's been in that, it's been in that state. Yeah. Yeah, so these are all cyclonic, cyclonic, cyclonic vortices uh, all rotating in the same, the same direction. Yeah. So yeah, so <laughs> weak into it. Okay, um, so cyclonic meaning that they're they're rotating the same in the same sense as the planetary the planetary rotation. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, no, so these are probably uh, I forget what. Uh, what bandwidth they're showing this, but it's just basically here to they're just illuminating the the structure, the structure of the structure of the vorticity. So. so we also know that again in in the deep interior of these these planets, ice giants and 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 and, and Jupiter and Saturn, as well as as well as the Earth, you know, um, you know these are all electrically electrically conducting fluids. So, um, you know, uh, fluid motions yeah, within there, uh, within the addition of rotation, they all generate, they all generate, you know, uh, magnetic field. There's dynamo actions going on within the fields. And you can see at least for the first three that, you know, you can get a sense that rotation is important in terms of when you're looking at the dipole, uh, the dipole magnetic fields that they're sort of aligned, aligned with the rotation, with the rotation axis. Uh, of of the planet, uh, the ice giants are just weird. <laughs> so, in terms of when you're looking at um, uh, the rotation axis and where where the dipoles are, uh, you know um, that's sort of an ill understood ill understood phenomena. But in a sense, you know, you've got rotation, you've got convection, you've got electri electrically in, uh, uh, conducting the interior, and you know that sort of generates through through magnetic induction generates um, can generate the uh, magnetic fields and they 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 turn up in the form of of a, of a dipole. Uh, do we roughly understand the scale, why the scale of the magnetic field is the way it is? This just like the the field of the equator, like how strong the magnetic field is. Do you have a good model for these? Or well, yeah. Well, in terms of you can produce them in in uh, fully you know fully um, spherical models of convection. You know you can understand the you know, at least get dipolar. You know, dipolar like signatures okay. and then. Like I'm far. sure they do in versions that they can sort of, you know, from measurements, understand the size, the size of size of these things. Okay. So this just, we're going through a tour. Yeah. So 
Um, and of course, in the Earth, you know, so I'm just sort of pointing out areas that are, you know, strongly rotationally, strongly rotationally influenced. If you're in the Earth, if we go into the the outer outward liquid iron core on the order of 2,000 2,000 kilometers, um, we know that this is also a region which is, you know, electrically conducting. It's, um, it's rotating, and we actually see here again that there's there's strong strong influences of rotation, and you see the generation the generation of magnetic fields as well during uh, in in sub object in such ob objects. Okay, so cool. I mean, you know, you can get here it's home, so one can get a sense, you know, in terms of observations about the stability of the magnetic fields. We saw that the sun was something that oscillated on a regular cycle of 22 years with chaotic chaotic overtones. Um, but in the Earth, it's a, you know, it's, it's a essentially a steady magnetic field with a dipole, and but it has these periods where it can invert, you know, so it goes through, it goes through periods of reversals. These reversals happen on the order of 100,000 100, years, and you can get in the record um, uh, times, you know, periods of times where you see this reversal. I guess the last re reversal was some three quarters of a million years ago. So it's kind of dynamic, dynamic object. And of course, what causes these uh, reversals is um, known to be interactions between between the, the fluid and things like the core mantle boundary and the inner, and the, and the inner core. Um, just even on the Earth itself, there are other places that we see more closer to home. If you go to if you're in, you know, looking at high latitude, high latitude oceans, uh, we know that there are there are events so up in places like the Labrador Sea or in the southern hemisphere, the Weddell Sea, where we actually see um, strong, strong convective events. I've picked this schematic out from Marshall's uh, review on open ocean deep convection. And he's talked about the phases of, of, of what happens there. So in the high latitude oceans, you know, with land masses, you get this uh, um, precondition or nice setup where you can, where you can, where you can error circulations. And these things tend to precondition cyclonic gyros, get low pressure regions. So they tend to precondition high latitude oceans to be to weaken the stratification. So you uh, raise the isopycnals here and during periods of strong atmospheric cooling in the high latitude oceans in the in the in, in the winter periods you get you, you get vigorous convective events where you get downwelling plumes on the order of 10 centimeters per second which is quite vigorous for the ocean and these are known to be rotationally influenced or rotating convection so um, they mix you know they, they mix the gyra uh, in this way and but this gyra also tends to be unstable to um, baroclinic or horizontal uh, instability, baroclinic instabilities. So after this mixing is done and you get this baroclinic mix mixing, you get this recapping of, of the ocean. This is, you know, again, if we'll talk about a parameter of the Rossbin number. It's low, so it's, so it's, it's lowish. So it, it's, it's, it is um, rotational influence. Um, one can't observe in, through observations the, the size of the plumes, but they're believed to be on the order of one, one kilometer. Once this event stops, you know, the reason why this is nice, it, the well-mixed well -mixed water is at the bottom. So it's actually a way of ventilating, ventilating the bottom ocean in this, in this, in this way. So these are high latitudes. If you're going out to so high, so places like Labrador Sea, you go to the Weddell Sea, and then you can even get it in the, in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea as well, if you go lower, lower, lower latitudes. So these sort of high latitudes. So these are sort of events that kind of motivate us. The, no, it's, 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 yeah. It's behind this, behind this. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah. But it's one way, and this is sort of thought to con contribute to the to the downwelling branch of the meridional overturning circulation that you know, which is refreshing the, the oceans on the millennial millennial period. So, this is also you know sort of one uh, an object that, that is of interest and motivates us in our in our work. And I'll end with most recently. This is sort of exciting. You know, this discovery of um, off world off world oceans. You know, so in the moons of of Saturn and Jupiter, which I sort of just you know, put a schematic here. So these were 
measured, you know, so these planets, these moons are moving through um, the planet, uh, their parents' uh, magnetic, magnetic field. And you see these, uh, what they can see from uh, measuring magnetic anomalies in, um, uh, from, from these objects, if you get close enough, uh, they get these anomalies which kind of essentially leads to the inference that of there, there are oceans there. Uh, I'm, not detailed, I'm not an expert on this, but they've measured the size, they managed to infer the size of these oceans with regard, uh, with regard to the scale of the, uh, the scale, the radial scale of these things, and they're quite deep. Yeah, in this thing, when you're looking at, you know, so I've got this down in the purple on, 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 on each one. So, and again, I'll show in a few moments when we start to look at some characteristics, num characteristic numbers, that you know these fluid, fluid motions they can be driven several ways. One is believed by again internal heating, so bottom heating. Okay, it can be driven by the salty, <laughs> so it can be driven by salinity flux, and they can also be driven by tidal tidal motions as well. Jeff. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, that's no, that's the gap of that's the that's the so I've quoted the the um, the gap, <laughs> the depth of the the depth of the layer. Okay, regard to the <laughs> no no no. So so these are supposed to be so you know two these are aqua you know the, the aqua planet oceans in some of they 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 around the entire the entire planet. So they get some sense of these by. You know, some flybys like Saturn and stuff like that, you can measure through these geysers. So they know when the geysers are going up, it's pretty vigorous. So they know there's obviously strong driving below. So, and and these are often, you know, these are often now excited about these. These may be uh, candidates for, you know, off-world life as well, because they measure organic compounds in some of the, some of the, in some of the measurements. Yes. So is there any analogy on Earth? Well, probably not on the earth in that in that sense, yeah. I mean if you go down to the trenches, but Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, there's another question. Okay. Sorry. I just wondered how that would be the difference, how the chemistry of percolation around the area and particularly a biomedical site. Yeah. And how it is like with our school percolation. Well, I say for this, lots is unknown about this, you know. So this is, you know, if, if they're being internally heating, these are sort of fully, it'll be sort of fully convective oceans, yeah, which is very different from, you know, yeah, the Earth, Earth ocean, which is not fully convective, of course, it's driven pointly in different manners and has different circulation patterns. So they'll be very different from that point of view. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Juno and Cassini. So Juno. Jupiter, Cassini, Cassini to Cassini to, to Saturn. Okay. So yeah, so this is sort of a that was sort of sort of motivating tour. We'll, we'll come back to these throughout throughout the talk as I sort of build up sort of you know sort of characteristics of 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 these of these of these objects as we go as we go through. But you know. Yeah, this is, you know, discovery of this means that, you know, if we're thinking about moons of exoplanets and stuff, you know, this, this is probably, and they, you know, they found it in four. <laughs> There's probably on others within the solar system. There have been predictions that even Pluto may have a sub, uh, subsurface ocean. So prominent and prevalent, basically, is, is probably the words to, to, use, to use there. Okay, so let's talk some fluid dynamics, I guess, <laughs> um, on this. So I'll... You know, you know, we believe when you say all the dynamics that happen in these objects are sort of should be faithfully captured by the Navier-Stokes equations, you know, indicating conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, conservation, conservation of mass. You probably, in the summer school, we've probably seen this a lot um, uh, through, through the last week. So we know that this is just, you know, this is just Newton's second law, 
um, where fluid inertia is being driven by uh, applied forces, the pressure gradient force, viscous force, and, and the body and the body force. And, um, and we have conservation. This is a general, general conservation of mass, which can apply to a compressible fluid in much what I talk about today. And next lectures, we're going to just consider incompressible <laughs> fluid motions, um, just from the idealized uh, point of view. So, you know, density of the following density changes following fluid parcels are going to be zero, um, which is good approximation if we're thinking about fluids at a low Mach number and um, whose thermo, in terms of changes of the thermodynamic variables to height are very small. One can derive these things here, but these are the equations we're going to look at. There was a lot of talk last week about characterizing forces by comparing two forces. <laughs> okay, I'll do the same here. So everything to be compared with the inertial advection force. And we like, you know, so given that we don't know, you know, we'll, uh, sort of the characteristics of some of these objects, or you know, we'll use a generic non-dimensionalization for velocity, length scales, time, and, and, and pressure. Presume that the known unknowns in, from, from, from this point of view. And when you compare characteristic scales in this, you get some of the characteristic numbers that we know. Um, we've got the Reynolds number, which shows sort of the importance of the viscous force compared to the um, in, inertial force. Oftentimes we absorb this one in here, but the Euler number talking about, I'll be using this today, the Euler number talking about the importance of the pressure gradient force with regard to uh, uh, advection term, and the Strahl number, if you do it that way, which is really the importance of the linear, linear time dependencies to the inertial force, which can often be important when you're trying to sort of identify uh, wave, wave dynamics in the, in the fluid equations. Okay, so, so we have those, and yeah, yeah. Pardon? No, so I haven't put rotation in yet. So rotation is right in here. I'm going to come down. I'm going to develop, build up on that, and I'm going to T is just T here is just is some generic time scale. Okay, so so you can think about you have some process. Okay, choose your favorite process, and there's going to be some character when you when you look at the characteristics of that process, you'll have a characteristic velocity. You have a characteristic length scale, characteristic time scale, characteristic pressure scale, okay? So it's really general right now. You can apply it to, to, to very different things, okay? So it's a general non-dimensionalization, um, but which produces these sort of generalized um, non-dimensional numbers, okay? When you go into a specific situation, we'll see later in the talk, you know, these non-dimensional numbers change to depending on the types of applications that we, that we have, okay? So... <clears throat> Let's go through. So let's talk about, you know, so some of these themes I'll come back to during 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 the lectures, but you know, let's talk about nonlinear energy cascades. So all about this term. Yeah. This is why we're here, why we're employed, <laughs> and why you'll be employed. You know, everything happens in <laughs> because of the nonlinearity in this in, in, in fluids. And I'm going to just go through sort of the classical picture of, of uh, fluid turbulence first, and then we'll work our way through the lecture to the alternative, or, well, yeah, an, an alternative or an, another viewpoint here. So we know that, you know, through uh, nonlinear interactions, if you take it into Fourier space, this nonlinear interactions will generate, you know, generate interactions between different, different scales. And there's this nice poem by Richardson here that kind of tells us you know, in a, at least produces this classical viewpoint about what is expected to happen in sort of uh, classical fluid turbulence. You know, big whales have little whales that feed on velocity, their velocity, and little whales have lesser whales, and so on to viscosity. Okay, so this sort of conjures up this image that I put here of of uh, energy, an energy cascade in the classical uh, uh, view of, of turbulence. So you can imagine here, there's an injection scale, a forcing scale where you're inputting energy into, into the fluid. So that could be for the giant, any of our giant planets, the, the buoyancy driving at the, <laughs> internally. And with Richardson's picture, you know, in this, this is the energy spectra versus wave number. There's a cascade of energy downscale until it is dissipated dissipated by um, dissipated by 
viscosity, okay? And one imagines that re this can reach, well, have, has reached the stationary state, okay? So that's sort of a steady, a steady picture of, of, of the energy dynamics in there, yeah. And you say a little bit more about thermal equilibrium which I haven't so this, I pulled this out of the Lexicarcasis thing. So this is that without, you know, the description here, without the, the event of, um, um, say, large scale damping or stuff, you know, it has to balance in some way. And they, they presume that the fluid, fluid has reached some sort of thermal, thermal equilibrium. Okay, so yeah, I should have quoted where I got this from, but this is from a review article by uh, Lexicarcasis and his collaborator. So you have this, okay, picture, but you know we can actually you know you know do some dimensional analysis on this picture you know so you know with the energy cascading from the forcing scale down to the down to the dissipation dissipation scales okay and kind of sort of invoking this picture of Richardson big wells little wells so on to viscosity here and you can use this, you can do some dimensional analysis on this and uh, get some important uh, you know, measurements out of it. So if you imagine that you're in steady state, you can have uh, uh, an injection scale. So you can have an energy injection scale here, okay, where, where it's been inputted, where it's been forced, okay. In stationary state, you can imagine that this energy injection is an energy flux going down scale and it's constant and then eventually taken out by viscosity at, at lower scales. And you can see larger eddies, you know, I can measure those number. I can characterize every one of these eddies by, this, these Reynolds numbers as we go, we go down scale. We know the units of energy, energy injection, the rate of change of energy per unit time here. So we can do like using these characteristic scales, we can get uh, sort of characteristic measurement of this. If you think of time as advective time here, L over U, you can, concept, you can transform it to this. This has to be equal to the energy flux going down, okay, in a steady state. And eventually, it's got to be taken out by you know energy, uh, any energy, energy dissipation, as we go as we go down scale. Well, if we do that, um, you know there are two um, character, uh, two known parameters that we know we can think about knowing the energy injection epsilon in the fluid, and we can think about knowing the scale, the size, the size of these uh, fluid elements. Okay. And just based on those two things, using the units of energy and the fluid elements, you know, one can sort of estimate or characterize the, the size of the velocity, the velocity scalings at a given length scale, and also the eddy turnover time at a given length scale in, in this way. So that's just sort of simple dimensional analysis. We know that this has to happen all the way down. You know, imagine this eddy is being characterized by this uh, velocity and time all the way down to where it's, where it's dissipated. And where it's dissipated, you know, we've got the Reynolds number, which you can think about as the uh, ratio of the, uh, uh, the fluid evection time scale to the viscous time scale. So when you get there, you know, they, to rub it out, it's gonna be order, order one, okay? So we can actually use these, this information and this information, and you can pick out some uh, characteristics of of the flow, you can do this. Is a whole other size, you know. So at, at the at the dissipation scale, you can actually compute what the dissipation length scale is <laughs> based on that the Reynolds number. So you've got the Kolmogorov dissipation scale. Once you have once you have that, you can plug those into the formulas down at that scale, and you can pick out you can determine what the viscous scale, the viscous velocity scale, and the time scale is down there. Just through simple simple dimensional. Um, analysis, okay? But you can also, um, um, this sort of gets to talking about the, the range, you know, we've got an injection scale. We can also pick out some things that talk about this, um, uh, this uh, the scale separation in time, velocity, and also, um, uh, and time, velocity, and, all, and also length scale. So, which is important to, to characterize this. So just, you know, it's, it's, simple back of the envelope. If you actually look at the definitions of the injection Reynolds number and the dissip dissipative Reynolds number, which is one, but if you put the definitions in there that we had before, you'll produce this, okay? So the length scale separation between the injection length scale and the viscous length scale is gonna scale like Reynolds number 
to the three, uh, scale that Reynolds number to the three quarter. Okay. Now, you can use, once you have that, <laughs> you can use this ratio and this fact, okay, to show <laughs> that the velocities scale that way. And once you have that, you can produce the, you can produce the, you can produce the last one. Okay. So this, you can imagine this thing here is actually gives us a sense of the scale separation or the degrees. You may think about the degrees of freedom that exist if you have this classical picture of turbulence that exists with, within, you know, within this picture. So, you know, so, um, and another thing you can do, so looking at, so this will talk about, we can estimate this, this range here. And another thing is talking about, you know, what is this power law um, <coughs> in this range? So in this range, we should fail to mention, this is the inertial range where no forcing or dissipation is acting and energy is just bouncing down, downwards in this way. You can actually, again, through scale analysis, if you use a definition, this is a total energy written in this way. Okay, if you take it into by Parseval's theorem into wave number space and assume that in this case isotropic, so you average over shells, you can get this the energy spectra or the energy per unit, you know, as a function of or wave number here. And you can do a simple scale analysis again from here. You know, if you're looking at the energy. This thing is defined as energy per unit, energy per unit wave number. You can do the same thing, balancing. You know, you can work out what its units are, okay. And you can think about the two knowns in the problem, which is the integral length scale and the injection scale, okay. You've got two uh, free constants there, and you just match them up. <laughs> and by dimensional analysis, you can actually show that you know this thing has to go like you know the wave number scale it has to go to minus five thirds, and. Uh, and then you get the energy, the energy part going like two thirds. So that's sort of the classical um, Kolmogorov, Kolmogorov, Kolmogorov picture here. So, so you know, we're going to go to talk about what happens in these objects. This is sort of a turbulence challenge. If you're thinking about three D turbulence, this is sort of an estimate. If you're talking about degrees of freedom <laughs> that one has to uh, resolve or uh, scale separation in in some of these classical objects. So if we go back to Let's go back to some of these objects here and sort of give some some characteristic some characteristic scales. Okay, so if we're looking at the Earth and if you're in the ocean, ten meters per second, we know uh, <laughs> scale of the gyros and the rotation of the Earth. We can do the same thing in the you know, trying to estimate um, the velocity fields that occur within the Earth. This is sort of gain from uh, tracking magnetic anomalies that occur in the Earth. So you track anomalies in this dipole magnetic field. And it gives, you know, this is used as a bound for the, for the uh, velocity scale. You can do the same for, you know, we know that observables if you use the order of the zonal winds on, 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 on the planet. And, well, the controversy in the sun, I guess, is whether, you know, um, you're on the order of 100 meters per second or what helioseismology is saying here that you have even uh, smaller flows with the interior of the sun. Um, whether you're around, you know, 10 meters per second. So, but you put it that in, you know, you're really showing that, yes, you know, these things are immensely turbulent, turbulent objects when you estimate the Reynolds numbers within, uh, within, within, within these objects. Yeah. yeah. Question. So we see the Reynolds number are all very large. So do they make any sense? For example, is the Earth less turbulent than the sun? Uh, are we <laughs> well, once you're up there, you're up there, I would say, in terms of that, you know, so, I mean, they're very large enough, so these are going to be, you hope that if you're in some sort of scaling regime of turbulence, you know, you're going to see some characteristic things, but these are all different, mightily different objects, so comparing them in that way, you know, you know different things are going on in each one of these, <laughs> each one of these objects. Yeah. And similar things, you know, if you, if you um, try to extract estimates, you know, extracting estimates from um, uh, uh, the moon. So, you know, this can be done uh, in a more, you know, um, implicit way. You can measure sort of a non-dimensional number based on the, the, the Rayleigh number, which tells you the, the size of uh, buoyancy forcing in that. And then you can extract out the Reynolds number. Okay, we're presuming that, you know, so it possibly goes like the square root of that. You can extract that. So these large, again. <laughs> um, and, you know, to make the point here, if, you know, so, sort of, you know, this is a relation of the degrees of freedom. You know, if you put the lowest one at, you know, so Reynolds number 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the eight on above, okay, 
this is what it means in terms of degrees of freedom in each direction. You know, your million degrees of freedom in each direction, which is beyond any of our uh, simulation powers right now. And if you look at typically what we're doing when you're doing Reynolds numbers, maybe 10 to the four, 10 to the five, we're sort of getting, you know, a thousand, a thousand to 10, you know, and, and beyond in terms of, in terms of, you know, what we can do there. So this sort of invokes that, you know, one, you know, we need, we need modeling. Yeah, <laughs> to sort of try, if we're going to try and attack some of these objects. Okay, so let's, you know, add the one force that this is about. So we we're gonna add the Coriolis force, which is um, given here. And we, we had discussions of this last week, but um, we know it's a, you know, it's a, it's a pseudo force that appears in the rotating frame of reference. So, it's, you know, if you're in the rotating frame of reference is a force that is, uh, designed to describe the motion you see um, within that in that frame. Um, you can go to many of you look, looking at Valis. You can go to Valis. You can pretty much um, um, derive um, um, how this comes about from uh, looking at <coughs> this relation here, where you're looking at motions in the inertial or lab frame compared to motions in the in the rotating uh, frame. So that's the most how what you would see in time rates of change in the rotating frame. And of course, in the lab frame, is that what you get in the rotating frame, plus that what you get due to that you get due to um, rotation. Now you can then you know take any you know, can derive other things from this very quickly. Plot the position vector in the frame in there, and you get this relationship of how your velocities in each frame uh, relate. And then you can take the velocity and pump it in here, and then you can eventually get you know. So this is not. Yeah, eventually get the relation we know. Okay, so when you're comparing inertial motions in the lab frame, what you see in the lab frame compared to what you see in the rotating frame, you get these two fictitious forces coming up here. One's a Coriolis force and one's a centrifugal force. Okay, so not too hard, not too hard to do. Now we know um, that, you know, so the, the Coriolis force, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere, there's a discussion this last week that, you know, it tends to, if you're following, following the direction of motion it tends to deflect it to the right and the opposite direction the opposite direction uh, uh, in the in the southern in, in, in the southern hemisphere so these are just sort of a quick summary summary of what we can have here and we also know if you're looking at um, vortical vortices or vortical motions you know so if you have a, a pressure low so you have a, um, a, a radially inward um, pressure gradient uh, occurring here, and this is, we'll get to this, we're talking about geostrophic balance, and you look at the Coriolis force, it's a flow is moving towards the center, and you get deflection to the right. You can see that, you know, in this vortices, in the pressure low, you're going to get this going um, <coughs> counter, counter clock, counterclockwise, okay? And similar if you go the other direction, and we know we observe this. So if you're looking in the northern hemisphere and you're looking at a, a cyclone, you know, with a pressure low, Okay, you can see this, you know, you can see, you can see this sense of, sense of rotation. I know Tiffany covered that last lecture, so in her lectures. So let's add, um, let's add the effect of, of rotation here. Yeah? And, and then we're gonna let's take a tour through some of the things that it implies in terms of the, in terms of the, uh, the dynamics, okay? So with rotation, comparing the Coriolis to the inertial terms, okay, we end up with the Rossby, Rossby number. So again, this is you know comparing the inertial force to the Coriolis, uh, the Coriolis, the Coriolis first force. It can also be interpreted as a ratio of <coughs> rotational time scale to the eddy to the eddy turnover time scale. And you know, typically types of motion that are going to be effective. So, if the relative, you know, this sense of the relative vorticity of the rotational time scale to the to the, to the evaction time scale, the evaction time scale is much smaller than the rotational time scale. Rossby number is less than one. This force is going to be promoted, and we know that the rotational forces are going to be uh, going to be important. And if we look at in terms of the Struhl number, the same thing. If that thing is equal to one or less, actually less than uh, equal to one, you know, you're going to see that the time tendencies here will also be important. But we can take, you know, let's go back to, a, this is an external measure. So if you recall, let's get a sense of the, the, the size of, the size of rotation on these objects. Okay, so those numbers, we can set them up here. You can plug all of these numbers 
uh, estimates into the Rossby number, and you can get a size. So in the in the oceans, you know, in, especially in open ocean deep convection, it's sort of order one, but less than one here. You can you can find in the um, large scale, larger scale motions in the in the oceans are uh, uh, give much more than Rossby numbers. The Earth is very small. Okay, when you look at that, so 10 to minus six is a, a, a small number. If you, if you do it based on the jets of, of Jupiter, there you go, 10 to minus two. Okay, and if you're in the sun, depending on what you believe, whether you're at 10 or 100, meters, uh, 100 meters per second, depending on what helioseismology uh, uh, is telling us, okay, you can get that it is indeed, indeed, a, um, you know, can, it can be small. Up to order one there okay so that's sort of that and if you do this for the uh, so this is if you do this for the the moons okay they're also yeah they're almost like the earth's interior actually so they're also quite they're also quite small okay so these are you know strongly constrained you know in terms of the, the in terms of the coriolis uh, rossby number you know these are highly rotational rotational influence influence so this is sort of a sort of an exciting era for exciting objects for rotating fluid dynamics, ocean dynamics. You know, who going going off world in terms of looking at these these objects. Yeah, Freddie. Mm -hmm. This is a really naive question. So, if you show us two types of convection, sometimes the convection is. Yeah. So the sun. So you. So. In this example, it is very localized. Are you meaning by the depth of the, the horizontal scale? Uh, so, if I understood, so here, for instance, you, you on your picture we see uh, biovolcanism. It seems that the brine and so on. So they are very oh, the, the those are details. Yeah, for for going to the surface. But if you're looking at, you know, I, I won't focus on those. If you're looking at what happens. <laughs> Globally, you know, there's I think there's you know, there'd probably be similar process in terms of looking at the rotating the turbulence going on, yeah. Right. So, it seems, so, so. seems you have two situations, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, ocean and this, this, uh, well, in the ocean, you get pretty small, you still get plumes, it's like one. Oh, so he's, he's Freddie's Fred, sorry, if, uh, thank you. Freddie's well, the question is really trying to think about the, the large scale circulate, uh, larger circulations versus. Small, uh, small, uh, uh, small, small structures appearing. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, these are obviously complicated objects with surfaces and stuff like that. You know, I would just say, you know, if you're looking at this as a convective layer, you know, heated from below, cool from above, they're probably going to, you know, show similar dynamics. You know, in terms of scales of convection, no one's really looked at that yet, right now, for hair. But certainly, if you look at it as a convecting object, I think there'll be similarities. So. I'm not sure I've quite got to the got quite got to your question, but this schematic is showing more of the details and and, and uh, structures that can be seen, you know, on, on on the planets. I don't think it belies what's really going on in terms of the underlying convective flows <laughs> on a more broader on a more broader scale. Yeah. 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 Sorry, repeat that question. Uh, if in the Earth context, would you consider the Hadley set convective? Or, uh, no, yeah, well, so, oh, okay, so thank you. Okay, from that point of view, like it's just even on, you've got the sun, you know, the Hadley cell, that's a large scale sort of average uh, response. It's not the small scale underlying eddy dynamics, but I will say if you're looking at there. So if you're looking at the sun, you may say, okay, you've got convection happening on small scales, okay. But when you go to the large scale, globally average patterns, you know, of course, you get the differential rotation pattern, which is, you know, global in terms of 25 day, days at the, at the equator and north. I didn't talk about it, but there's also a Hadley cell in the sun, which is meridional, which is a large scale, you know, one large scale overturning, overturning circulation. That's not convection. That's a response of convection driving, you know, driving these large scale, driving these large scale structures. Okay. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> yeah, so we'll get to the Ekman number, okay? Um, it's small, it's all small, yeah, yeah. These are all small, yeah? So in all these objects, you know, so you see the questions about what's the Ekman number, another non-dimensional number, which is relating the ratios again, 
viscosity to the Coriolis force. If you're doing that, you get the Ekman number. So in all these objects, they're small, like 10 to the minus, <laughs> 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 12, 12 or so. Yeah. So, and then if you take that to the one half, you know, you get if there's any, you know, that's the Ekman, that's the depth of the Ekman, Ekman layer. So they're, they're extremely small for all these for, for these objects. Okay. So we'll get to, we're going to come back to the Ekman number in the lecture. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so hopefully we'll get through this. So let's look at some of the dynamics by so what I'm going to do. I'm going to play with these numbers to get you know with, to get you a feel. And so I'm going to vary them and pick out what the dominant the dominant uh, the dominant balances are in this. So let's take the first one. So we'll call, look at you know this is sort of idea uh, uh, illuminate you know inertial oscillations, which is a motion that happens in rotative fluids. So um, we're going to um, presume that the pressure gradient forces are not important. So it's presiding characteristic number. The, the Euler number is not large enough to, to pull it up into the dominant, dominant balance. We we'll assume that time dependence is important. So we can sort of talk about the Stuhl number, Rossman number being order one. And we're going to think about motions being inviscid. So Reynolds number large. Actually, in this sense, when we've got a small, and the Rossby number is always small here. It doesn't really have to be that, lo that large. It can be order one and still be subdominant. Yes. It's just the importance of the time dependence term. So this is again when we were just simply comparing two terms to the every term is being compared to the inertial term. And if you do that, there's a non-dimensional number in front of it. Yeah. So it's just telling you the importance of the, the importance of the time dependent, the time dependent term. Okay, so okay, so we can go through. Uh, kind of, this is in the. I think Jeffrey will share notes with you. I can skip things here. You know, we can do some math. You know, uh, collapse that. We get a wave equation. We can put an ansatz <laughs> into that. Okay, and we can pull out. Um, we can pull out the solutions to this, and we can get a dispersion dispersion relation in this non-dimensional form, which tells you the frequency. The frequency of the inertial oscillations. If you dimensionalize that, that just says that omega, small omega, the frequency is two omega. It's the frequency, it's just the frequency of the, the frequency of the rotation, the rotation rate. Yeah. So you can find that one can find the period, and you can so again you can explicitly write out, you know. So I'm just doing here here what the velocity fields is, it's just a simple, um, a simple harmonic oscillation for the for the velocity field at every, because there's no a uh, spatial structure in these equations is, is for every point, um, point in space. And if you're not, if you dimensionalize it, I just did that to sort of highlight this is oscillating, oscillating at the um, uh, rotational, uh, rotational frequency. Um, so given that, you can also sort of think about what happens to motions of uh, you know fluid particles. Okay, and what you see if you, you know, just follow an advection equation with velocities driving. Um, driving um, a fluid particle motion. So um, it's going to happen for an inviscid fluid with a starting position. What you see here is that you get these inertial, you just get inertial, inertial oscillations. Okay, so sigma here is just plus or minus here. So you get um, two types depending on you know, what, where you are. You know, the sigma gives you two types of that. What you see is that you get an inertial oscillation that is just based on the size, the initial size of the velocity field and the rotation rate. So particles would just follow, particles just follow circular, circular paths. And can you see these? Yes, you can see them in the ocean. So you can look, and typically you're looking at, you know, passive particles or buoys in the ocean. You can actually see these. So this first one here is looking at um, uh, uh, particles, uh, uh, buoys probably, or uh, equipment at depth. Here and they're just doing it every half period, and you can kind of see this sort of almost pattern matching, you know, almost the uh, <coughs> as expected from the solution anti 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 signature. And then you can see here if you have this is just a buoy that is being tracked, which has has um, some drift on it. And as you track that motion of the buoy, you can actually see you can actually see evidence of the inertial the inertial oscillation um, inertial oscillation in the buoy. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, so what your question was, why can I net non nonlinear terms? So you can imagine these waves are of weak amplitude. We're going to get to that. The waves are of weak amplitude, okay? 
then you can, you know, the nonlinear non interactions are, are quite sm are small, okay? So, and we'll, we'll play on that as we go through, okay? So, no, 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 well, no, 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 no. So Rossby wave, so, so as you add these terms, you're adding another force, okay? So um, Rossby waves are driven by uh, variations in the, in the planetary rotation. So here, not, you know, they're not, they're not in this. This at all. Okay, so just strict. All I'm doing is just time dependence and the Coriolis force. Yeah, so that's the only things that are in the equation. So it's just strictly, um, you know, this is uh, uh, the Coriolis force is a restoring force. It's showing the signature, <laughs> the wave signature of of the Coriolis force. Here. And you can actually see this in in in, in what we call inertial motions, you know, Coriolis motions. You know. You know. So, 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 yeah, yeah. So, if, so the dispersion range is quite simple. It's omega equals to omega. It's a frequency. It's just a constant. But what you're asking is basically it depends on the initial, the initial velocity. You know, it's characterized. These circles or the thing is characterized, characterized by the velocity, the initial velocity, of the fluid. So, you know, if it, you know, you've got on the one I should on the next slide. But if you're just tracking this, it's just u over two omega. So that gives you the size. The size of the of the circling, yeah, and then you got drift at the same time. Okay, okay, okay. So, yes. Oh, so I yeah, you pull this off. This is really just measuring. You know, it's measuring. Um, if you're looking, imagine you can have here. You've got a buoy here, but you can imagine you can have you can have a. Um, a measurement device here at different depths, and you're just looking at its displacement. You know, if it's supposed to be sitting there, you know, it's on Earth, it's got the Coriolis force, so it's actually it's actually doing these things here. You know, during the cycle, and you measure it at one here, half a day later, it's over here, <laughs> okay, and back again. So as you go with depth, this is just showing that you know, if you measure, if you strobe in the right way, you're going to see the anti-signal, <laughs> you know, on that. So it's just sort of showing evidence of the. Inertial, you know, inertial oscillation, you know, within within the oceans here. Pardon? Oh, you asked me things. I'm good. How big is the buoy? Yeah. How this has happened? So most of the energy in inertial waves are in the upper, you know, in upper oceans. Yeah. Okay. So as you can see, the depth the depth here is, you know, well, this one's going down to, you know, well, deep seven. <laughs> it's going quite deep and in, deep into the ocean. We have some experts here probably going to chime in, so let's go. Uh, so I guess I did half the energy, so, so. So, yeah, well, it's just talking about half the energy in the inertial wave band is, <laughs> yeah, I think it does. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, no, okay, so you get into the details of measurements that is not also not always my forte. So, so this is just, yes. How's the flow driven if we don't have some force in the. There's always force in, yeah. So, like, um, let me go back, sorry. I haven't put it down here, but you know, this has an initial boost impulse, maybe, yeah. So then you're just tracking, you're just tracking the, the drift. So, this may be wind blowing the thing, but as it's blowing, you're seeing, yeah. Okay, so these are, I mean, the equations I put down are quite idealized. You're picking out the, the force, you're looking at what it's telling you, and then you're going to see whether you see signatures of that, um, signatures of that within the ocean. Okay, so, um, okay, inertial waves, so sort of increasing in complexity here. So now we're going to include um, the pressure gradient force. Okay, so, Apply a mathematician, so we're just tweaking non dimensional numbers here. So we're raising the Euler number up, <laughs> okay, so that it, it rises to the level of prominence in the dominant in the dominant balance here, okay. And with that, you know, because it's there, um, you know, pressure in, in incompressible fluid is really just the you know, the rectifier for incompressibility, okay. So we include incompressibility here. So there are equations. We can now play with these, okay, and and show that they lead to inertial waves, okay. So standard things we can do: we can do our normal mode plane wave, uh, plane wave analysis here. So you presume a 
a normal no mode, wave number K, you know, frequency omega, plug it in. Um, we know from incompressibility that um, the wave vector and, and the velocity vectors are orthogonal. And I've collapsed this for simplification, the horizontal wave number, I'm just characterizing by magnitude. So I'm not really, and that's what I tell you, I'm not really talking about its orientation here, just talking about its, its magnitude. You can plug that all, um, and then you can play with these games. So as you do this, this is not so quick. You can eliminate, you know, eliminate pressure terms, and you can come to this wave equation, okay? Where the first one, you know, you've got rate of change of vorticity is being actually driven by planetary uh, vortex stretching. So that's what that equation says, and we have the second equation here. This can be collapsed, okay? Again, just much like the other. Okay, and you get this, you get this wave equation, but now unlike the first one, the Coriolis, when we were just looking at inertial oscillations, we've got time, we've got spatial dependencies in here as well. Okay, so if we do this and we, <laughs> we get this dispersion relation, okay, which is the inertial wave, the inertial wave dispersion, dispersion relation, okay? And it's quite strange if you look at it, if you look at the right-hand side here, is that you see that this dispersion relation Okay, does not depend on wave number. The, wave, the frequency doesn't pay. It just depends on the orientation, the orientation of the, uh, the wave number. If you dimensionalize this, put stars on this, this would just be omega is equal to two omega sine theta, sine, sine theta where phi again is the wave number angle, the, the angle the wave number makes with the, hor makes with the horizontal, with the horizontal, okay? So you get this dispersion relation and, you know, Let's play with this some more. So you got, you know, here it is here, and see, let's just sort of see what sort, what can we extract? What can we extract from this? Okay, it's just play, you know, reading the dispersion relation. So here's, you know, the wave number, you know, with the, its orientation uh, phi. If you play with this, I'm just sort of think about what happens to the frequency. So it says if phi is equal to zero, so that means that if we're thinking about phase fronts, phase fronts are going to be perpendicular to the rotation axis. You can see that the frequency is, um, is uh, the frequencies of oscillation is very slow, okay, in this thing. And we'll come back to that in a second. Whereas if we have it, you know, um, uh, uh, pi over two, 90 degrees, so these are phase fronts that are moving per perpendicular, perpendicular to the to the to the rotation axis, and that means you've got you know uh, the waves are moving up and down. You know, those are you know traveling traveling. Um, at the inertial frequency. So waves are going up, traveling inertial frequency as you go down, they slow, they slow, they, they in fact slow down. Yep. I think it looks quite similar to purely internal gravity. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, they well by math, yes, but they 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 have they you see they have the same they have similar same properties. Yeah. So if you go to do just strictly inertial gravity waves, okay. I'm not gonna do that, but even more complicated when you put them together as well. Yeah. So yeah, but that's right. It's a, a great statement. So you can um, also, you know, look at the, you know, typically look at the phase velocities for these things. Okay. And you know, just omega over k, just put it here. But again, you know, I just wanted to do this to make a point here when you're looking at um, the phase velocities or the relative velocities as to waves propagating upwards versus waves propagating propagating um, um, uh, laterally. So you can see waves that are propagating laterally are, you know, they have very slow, they're slower, you know, almost approaching zero, okay? And we'll see sort of almost uh, approaching sort of what we call eddy turnover times. So they propagate these slowly in the horizontal, whereas um, those propagating upwards uh, <laughs> propagate more rapidly. And there is a wave number dependence in there as well. So, if we add, you know, then, so these are just the phase velocities. If you get wave packets and you're looking at actually how these packets or waves move, you get, you know, so same as gravity, internal gravity waves as well. You get this uh, relation that is, um, you know, that you know, um, the direction of phase, phase propagation of the phase, of the way the waves moving and the group velocity of the packet are orthogonal, okay? So we see that these slowly moving, slowly moving uh, horizontal things are being carried up and down, yeah? Whereas the fast moving <laughs> vertical waves are being carried laterally, laterally by the, uh, the, 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 the gravity waves. And you can do, 
this is in my notes, so I won't say that, but you can do some analysis of that. So you've got the slowly propagating uh, phase velocity, and they have quite large magnitude in terms of the way the group velocities are being carried up and far, up, 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 and, up and down, and it's vice, it's vice versa with that. So if you've got the rapidly uh, um, <coughs> phase pro, uh, propagating uh, waves and uh, phase fronts here, they're moving quite slow. The group velocity relatively to, to the other is moving quite, quite slowly in that. But the comment, the comment that I want to make here is that, you know, this is, this is an anisotropy, which is typical of geophysical fluids here. So you can see that here, you know, there's a propensity if you're looking at where, how energy is being carried, you know, it's by these slow waves upwards, yeah? So rotation is trying to, it's got this an anisotropy that sort of favors the rotation axis, okay? So you can kind of build, it wants to be anisotropic in that way. Yeah, and we'll come to that in a, in a, in a moment, okay, when we start looking at um, the next thing. So um, can you observe these? Yes, you know, this is a, recently, a recent experiment of um, inertial waves. So it's just basically a rotating tank. We've got some inlet valves at the bottom. So you're kind of, you know, forcing, forcing the fluid and you're generating, you know, in terms of generating inertial, inertial waves. Okay, and these are weaker inertial waves. So to go to the question, the weak inertial waves, so the, the nonlinear interactions are weak. They are interacting, but the nonlinear interactions are weak. And what they see here is that they actually um, <coughs> using, so it's a particle laden flow, they're taking uh, PIV measurements of particles in the horizontal plane and they're scanning up and down pretty quickly. So they're getting a three, a three dimensional um, energy uh, energy space time space uh, time space signature of the of the energy within a, a, a given uh, region of the tank they Fourier transform it and what they find is that um, they see that you know everything the energy sort of uh, um, um, collapses onto this um, I don't have it here, onto this yeah you know, so this dispersion relation so what it really says is that you know and, and, and the energy is moving upscale to larger and larger structures so what it's really saying is that you know all the dynamics here is is, is being is being uh, controlled by inertial inertial wave dynamics and it's falling on this dispersion relation here. So there's some nice signatures that you can see here. Okay, inertial wave. So we talked about these, you know, and let's go to especially the ones that were propagating upward. We kind of talked about this sort of anisotropy um, that has uh, the tendency. Uh, in uh, rotating flows, and especially we looked at the inertial waves that are traveling uh, perpendicular, but group velocities are uh, parallel to the rotation rate, having pretty slow, uh, pretty slow frequencies. Yeah, so you know you can imagine this, and the limit is dropping out, but this also gets to a limit that also talks about um, eddy dynamics. So this is sort of thinking about fluid motions, not waves, eddy dynamics. That is very um, whose time scale is much uh, much longer than the rotation rate, actually. So you get to this the final of you, know, you take this out and you get to this final of the dominant balances, um, which is you know this is the um, geostrophic balance. So the dominant balance where you know you just have the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient force are the dominant two terms in the um, Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, so, and we're assuming incompressibility here. Yeah? You need not do that. If you, you know, it turns out this can work in, in compressible fluids. We say some about in compressible fluids. We say some about that maybe next lecture. Okay, so this was, you know, this is effect after experiments of Proudman. Okay, who we'll see the modern uh, rendition of that in the, on the next slide where he was just looking at moving a fluid object in a rotating flow. And the theory, you know, was, uh, was uh, provided by uh, Taylor. So sometimes you hear it as a Proudman, a Taylor-Proudman theorem, which is typical. Other times you use it as Proudman-Taylor. Um, but I know that, you know, Proudman became some, I've been told this by some seniors, Proudman became, came before Taylor. <laughs> so, but I'll use them interchangeably. <laughs> you know, he, he showed it. He understood, <laughs> okay. So you get it that way. But you know, so this is you know, so here it is geostrophic balance. You don't have to do too much math on this. You know, just do these two operations on the uh, this momentum balance here, in there, and you can see, 
you, you get what we call this Taylor Proudmoore constraint in this thing. So it's just basically saying that, you know, fluid motions and pressure, okay, want to be invariant, invariant along the invariant along the rotation axis. Okay. So this is sort of talking about columnar co uh, columnar motions. Okay. So and you can see this. So good colleague of mine, John Arno at UCLA, you know, likes doing experiments on this. But this is it. So you can imagine an object here, which is you know depth limited. And this is going to kind of schematically shows the Taylor problem effect, even though you have a fluid that is moving left to right here. Okay, the consequence of this, okay, that fluid motions are invariant in the vertical is that you've got this phantom column here. It's as if there's a there's an object there, <laughs> and fluids move around it. Okay, so this is what you know. Here's a uh, movie by John showing that you know. So this is the non-rotating or low rotating case where he's put a puck in there. You know, using food co food coloring, make modern use of these uh, extinct record players. Okay, well, not extinct, but we don't use them. So he's put it on, he's put a die in, and then you know he's going to rotate it. But this is supposed to be just to get it more like a shear flow going around. The rotation rate is very force is very slow here, and he rotates it. So this is much like um, uh, Professor Falkovich was talking about last thing when you're looking about flow flow around an object, it goes all the way around. And this is a top view. Okay, and the point is when he, when they were, when they put a flow around the tank, you know, it just flows, you know, this is on the surface, there's no impact um, with the object. So now turn the record player up, 33 RPM. Those of you old enough may know what that is. Okay, at this. 33 RPM, and then at some stage he's got a food die in here, then he's going to adjust, you know, give a discrete jump in the rotation rate, okay? And, you know, this is in the lab frame, so we talked about the lab frame, and then in a moment he's going to go into the, he's going to go into the rotating frame. So here it is here. So we've got this, got this, so everything is sort of moving at solid body rotation with the rotation rate here. And then all of a sudden, at some stage, he's going to add this injection. So he set the set the set it in motion before it readjusts the solid body, rota solid body rotation. And as this is on the surface, and you can see <coughs> the impact of the the Taylor problem of the impact of this column. Yeah. Yeah, well, of course, if you go there, there's always viscosity. So, you know, there's always, you know, there's also, there's also those, there's always these the dynamics there. But the overriding thing here is that, you know, you've got motions being invariant on the, in, in the vertical here. Okay. If you're looking at this closely, can you notice something else? So, go up again. So, let me play the next one. So, I'll move over to this. So if, same thing, just play, play it once more. I can't advance it that far. But if you just, just look at the surface, look at when it, when it goes again, um, look at the surface of the, of the fluid. And you know, this is almost, you know, it's almost a bucket and water experiment in some sense, you know, but you have, you know, you've got this record player, but it's not, you know, it's not high precision. So this thing is not really completely on axis, yeah? So if you look at the surface, once we play it again, see if you notice something else. I can't speed up, sorry. <laughs> I have to take a small break. Okay, while well, it's getting there, 
Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay. You can see it there. What can you notice? You can notice the inertial oscillation, yeah? <laughs> so it's not quite on axis. <laughs> so you're talking about a force in terms, so as it's going through, there's a force in all the fluid. And you know, you can <laughs> you can see you can see the inertial oscillations on top of the flow here. Okay, so Okay, so this, you know, last 10 minutes of that, probably good timing. So, um, you know, so, you know, most of GFD, I should say, is how you break this theorem. <laughs> yeah, so when you're looking at the taylor Proudmoore theorem, that tells you everything wants to be invariant in the, in, in, the, in the vertical direction. You know, we talked about last week about large scale, you know, large scale flows. You know, if, if Taylor Proudman was um, completely in effect, you know, you won't have three dimensional motion. So the question is, how do you break that? Okay, we'll talk about that next lecture. But for now, and it turns out you can, you can break, you can break it. So in, in terms of columns, in terms of convection, we'll see if that this, you know, in, in the Taylor Proudman theorem, implicit in that is that the inherent length scale that we saw there was just the puck, yeah? The length scale of the puck, okay? So if you're actually talking about what the equations say, it's really telling you that you're invariant in the vertical, vertical on the length scale of the puck. You know, d by dz is going to be zero on that scale. Okay, we'll see that if you allow, if it's permissible to have scales much longer than the size of the puck. Okay, you can actually satisfy or you know accommodate the Taylor, Taylor Proudman theorem by having modulations on that scale, and that's precisely what you get in the convective in the convective regime. You can't do that if the puck is very wide. So thinking about sort of the standard thing of stable layers, atmospheric stable layers, you can't do that. So you've got to break it different ways, and one way of doing that is the buoyancy forcing must come in to break to break the to break that to break that constraint while still preserving preserving geostrophy. But here, let's presume that. So um, as a thing, we're looking at these scales that are uh, pretty um, uh, larger than the horizontal, uh, the vertical scale. So we're presuming that we can't break um, uh, uh, this scale and nothing else comes in, no buoyancy forcing or anything like that. So, you know, here's Taylor Proudman. It says we're gonna have invariance in the vertical. And we can imagine that we're thinking about our velocity field being this uh, geostrophic field that is uh, <coughs> large now two dimensional. If you've got invariance in that, you know, boundary vertical motions are going to be going to be zero, and everything else we know it's horizontally incompressible. So we can relate the velocity field to the, the um, to the pressure string function. So this is really p. Yeah. So you know the uh, the string function is the pressure pressure field, and we can also relate that to the curl of the, the curl of the velocity field, the geostrophic velocity field to the vorticity, um, the vorticity in this way. So we can plug that into the Navier-Stokes equation. Here we can take in a, we've taken account for the for the geostrophic balance. So these things are leading order of the G field here. So here's this equation here, and we have we're not presuming anything. You know, no no smaller vertical velocity, so strictly Taylor Proudman, we're also assuming that even the geostrophic, a geostrophic field or the complement is also horizontally invariant, invariant. So once we do that, you know, we can get to the, take the curl of this, you can get, you know, you get to the barotropic vorticity, barotropic vorticity equation in this way, which can be forced and, and dissipating. And this is just the vorticity. You can write it out explicitly. And we can think about the dissipation as, you know, viscous dissipation. And maybe, you know, if you've got friction on the boundary, you know, and you sort of integrate, you know, given that things may be leading order environment, you can get some really friction in there as well. So um, if you neglect forcing and dissipation, you can actually show that there are, you know, two, two conserved 
could to conserve quantities here, yeah, energy and entropy. And we'll motivate this in a second, but if you actually force this fluid, okay, and, and uh, either decay or keep, uh, keep forcing it, what you see is that you actually see the dynamics, the uh, energy uh, transfers upscale, yeah, which is very different from the initial picture that I showed, you know, in classical turbulence where you force, that one only has one con conserved quantity, the energy, and you get this direct state, uh, direct uh, cascade. So one of the implications of this sort of two-dimensionality of a fluid flow when it's forced is that you see uh, an inverse energy cascade. So five minutes or so, but I can, I think I can get this done. You can motivate this. So in a similar picture, there's a nice sort of review article by, by Feta and Eki where you can um, look at these things. So here's sort of the energy cascade, energy cascade picture here. So you're forcing at an injection scale with a, now you've got an injection rate of energy and an injection rate of entropy. Here you're forcing at some scale and we've just seen that, you know, there's a tendency for energy to go up scale and you can actually show, which will show at least um, ideate in a moment that entropy or the mean squared vorticity cascades downscale. So you have a sort of similar picture to the forward cascade, which is the, the right. We can imagine that up here, you've got a dissipation of energy and entropy. Down here, you've got dissipation of energy and entropy. It's in a steady state, okay? So you can imagine you've got constant fluxes, constant fluxes of, of energy and entropy traveling up and down. Okay, so this is just this picture here. You know, you've got a steady state, so the injection rate, you must balance with the dissipation terms in both energy and entropy. The ratio of these two things, okay, can provide you about what the length scale, the length scales are at the top and the bottom. Okay, entropy being the square, so you pick up an extra L squared in there. So you've got this, so you've got this ratio here. And you can also say the same for the ratio, you know, uh, um, the ratio, and um, the forcing scale here can look can be the ratio of these two terms here. Okay, actually, if you put all that together, you can actually solve that. And then this is sort of shown not by Buffetta and Eki, but um, I think by Greg Ike actually in, um, in 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 this. If you solve these equations, you can solve for the ratio. You can solve for the ratio of these of these terms in this way. Okay, so that's an exercise, and you can see it's really dependent on the ratios of these length scales. So. Dissipative length scale down here, forcing length scale and the length scale, you know, at, at the top here. So you can solve those equations and you can get it there. And this, if you analyze these two equations for the ratio of the dissipation rate at the small scale, the energy dissipation, small scale, large scale, entity dissipation, small scale, large scale, you can actually see that, you know, <laughs> you can see this tendency for the inverse cascade. So we're imagining a picture where there's good scale separation between between the forcing and, and the dissipation rates here. So simple arguments, once you derive these things uh, here, that if you imagine that the forcing scale is well se separated from um, this high-end um, um, dissipation scale here, that gives you this, okay? Take the limit of that being very large and put it into here. You see that the energy dissipation down here, okay, is, is, is going to zero compared to that. So, you know, most of the energy is being dissipated up here rather than there, which is tantamount saying that the energy is propagating, propagating upscale, okay? Similarly, you do the other one where you get L alpha is greater than LF, okay? You put that in and you look at, uh, you look at the inverse of this ratio, you, say, you get the similar result. So this sort of motivates, energy, this inverse cas energy cascade where the energy is going up and entropy um, going down, mean squared vorticity. So this is really, when you're looking at these diagrams, this is really, you know, entropy is very large in this filamentation of, 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 of the fluid flow. So that's what's being dissipated in here. And the large scale eddy structures that are moving up as being, is what's being dissipated, dissipating, uh, dissipating upscale, okay. So <laughs> I'm gonna add one more piece. Um, so this was really just trying to get us to have a feel for rotation. Yeah, so in terms of what it does, um, the important thing that we'll play with um, next lecture is you know, the consequence of geostrophic balance. Yeah, so how do we get out of it? <laughs> yeah, and um, so, in, you know, so that leads to the, you know, uh, uh, the theory of quasi-geostrophy. Okay, so 
um, we can certainly do this. Oh, I didn't say here, you can derive these scaling laws by similar dimensional arguments here. But how do you get our quasi geostrophy, geostrophy? So if you pick up a classical textbook uh, by Dallas, you know, it's always looking at strongly stabilized, strongly stable atmospheres, okay, uh, where aspect ratio, as, as Tiffany Shaw uh, put it. But you still see the same thing in convection. You see a, you see a geostrophic balance. <laughs> And, you know, the idea is how to get out of that, yeah? So next lecture, I'll try, I'll, you know, we'll be playing with it, deriving it, okay? And I'll try to put it in a sort of a unified framework where you can see, you know, QG theory uh, at play and you can, you can take your choice by varying the parameter of an isotropy and see what turns up at the end, okay? So we'll, we'll do that next lecture. Okay, right on the dot, I guess, so thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Vortex stretching. Well, hey, you still get so in 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 this case, yeah. Well, you still see the you know it's the filament. You know when you saw the picture, essentially entropy the mean squared vorticity. So you're looking at vorticity gradients, yeah. So if you're, can I go back? You know, it's kind, of, it's kind of hard to see here, but if you're thinking about, you know, these filaments, you know, with large gradients, these, these are the things that, you know, that carry, carry, uh, carry the entropy, you know, mean squared vorticity, you know, the gradients is large, and those are the things that are being, that are, that are being uh, dissipated. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's what you typically do. So um, it can be absorbed in the pressure, you know, but, you know, I, I put it there for explicit, you know, um, you know, we're playing with tunable parameters. So when I put that, when I did just this characteristic comparing forces, you come up with the Euler number, yeah? The, it, it, well, it tells you how large a pressure field has to be, yeah? Okay, it's for it to be, to be important. So when I went through these three things, the inertial wave, the inertial, the inertial oscillations, it didn't play any role, yeah? So I was controlling, I could have said the pressure small enough, okay? But, you know, if you're just, again, applied mathematician, putting non-dimensional parameters in front of your term, I'm tuning these things, yeah? So I've just tuned it down. It means I just put the pressure down. But typically you're right. I mean, you can always, it does nothing. You can show you can just redefine your pressure <laughs> and it's gone, yeah? So, yeah. So it's a you know, good observation. <laughs> yeah. Pardon? Say it again. Uh, yes, I mean, it's really, so it, in the point of, um, from the point, well, um, so you can imagine, yes, sort of loosely, I should say, hey, so you can imagine you've got dissipative forces in here. So I've integrated down. Okay, so I still have this dominant, and for this picture, I'm still saying I have this dominant balance. Okay, so geostrophy is still holding, okay? And I'm still, I still have horizontal incompressibility on the leading order velocity field, okay? So that's the Taylor-Proudman theorem, okay? What I did then, so that's, that's still, that's my dominant uh, balance in the Navier-Stokes equation, okay? So that's up there. When you're look, looking at this equation here, this is sort of quasi, you know, sort of quasi geostrophic geostrophy for a barotropic vortex. I've gone down to a lower order balance, okay? So this is where I bring in the dynamic terms, okay? So I'm bringing in the dynamics, the evolution of the geostrophic field, okay? And at this stage, uh, uh, dissipation is coming in as well, okay? So it's not large enough in terms of my ordering of balance to rise into the leading order geostrophic balance. So it is consistent from that, uh, from that point of view. Yeah. So in pictures for different planets and with their rotation axis, it would seem for one of them, the rotation axis is very different from the next. Yeah, those are the, yeah. So oh, both Uranus and um, uh, Neptune have, magnetic fields that are, you know, why, why? <laughs> <laughs> open, open, open question in terms of that, you know, and you saw when they did that, they just sort of think about it as a displaced, a displaced, dip, a displaced dipole, okay, but that's open theory, I mean, I, you know, 
you probably have to ask a energy expert, but I've not really seen a, 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 a physical, <laughs> you know, accepted argument as to why that is, why that is the case right. for the ice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this here, this one here, so it goes sort of relates to the, the earlier question. So he's asking where does this first terminal dissipation term comes from? Well, you can well you can imagine. So this is a high water. You can imagine that I've got a layer. I've got the Taylor Proudman there. You know, you've got motions moving. There is a friction layer there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there's going to be friction. You know, which is okay. It doesn't disturb the, the leading or geostrophic balance. It comes in in this dynamic term. But you can think that now that these fields are essentially to first order invariant in the vertical, if you integrate down, okay, you can see, you can capture the effect of, you can capture the effect of friction. And it turns out to be, you know, linear, linear in this way as a, as a Rayleigh, a Rayleigh friction term. So, you know, if you look in, Vallis will show this as well. If you show that, you can show you how you get that into, into the equation here. So. Okay. Yeah, so you can think about it. So that was the question, sorry, was it Ekman? You know, you get Ekman, Ekman pumping. You know, if you write that relationship beyond Ekman pumping, there is friction, to, there is friction in there as well. So when you integrate down, you'll see this really, really, you'll see this really friction, um, really friction term as well. So in previous lectures, we learned that for QD flows, you get this inverse energy cascade. Yes. And here you're saying that this system is effectively 2D. Yes. So then is it, can, so I guess what, can we just import all the knowledge we know about 2D turbulence to the problem or is there no. something extra stuff? <laughs> No, there's, there's going to be extra stuff. So when we go to, um, so we're going to do rotating convection, okay, which is not a 2D system, okay? Very much unlike a 2D system, but we'll see. So we'll, at, the current, the, at the current stage on that plot that you showed yeah. on the next slide, is that just a statement of 2D, uh, yeah. 2D turbulence? Yeah, okay. yeah, yes, yeah. So the idea is that when you, when we will see this in, in, in the next lectures, but you probably in Friday, but you can see, even though you've got 3D flows that has embedded Taylor Proudman, okay? You will see there's some signatures of both. <laughs> okay, the sub signature of both types of cascades. Okay, in there. Yeah. Uh, this is, I guess, just, just words. Um, you keep that paratropic up there. Oh. Paratropic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, depth independence <laughs> along the road. Yes, yes, I did. No yeah. accident. No. <laughs> no. Next yeah. yeah. Well, next lecture, I'm going to get right into rotating convection, and we're going to start looking at, you know, um, well, ultimately, you know, rotation, I should say, here, you know, when you look at this picture, we have here. I mean, that I talked about the forward cascade, and, you know, we talked about, you know, looking at Reynolds numbers and the separation scales. This is doubly bad. Yeah because you're going in two directions, you know, and you're trying to capture the dynamics, <laughs> you know, the large scales and the small scales simultaneously, simultaneously. So this is, you know, in terms of, you know, and you can imagine going to a 3D picture, you know, this is, you know, this becomes you know, uh, uh, pretty prohibitive, yeah? But we'll see that, you know, there are, you know, so in, you know, in, you know, uh, classical GFD or stable air dynamics, you know, QG is, uh, is it's sorry, QG is, is a, um, a reduction of the Navier Stokes equation. Yeah. You can collapse it all the way down to one variable. Okay. And that gives you scope to sort of, you know, try out and investigate ideas of dynamics, you know. So oftentimes you know, uh, people have, you know, when you're trying to investigate dynamics or some theoretical ideas, you start in, <laughs> you start in the limit of quasi geostrophy, you know, you model in that, you know, and then, you know, you may go back into, to the to larger equations when you see that. So it's a nice modeling paradigm, okay? And we'll see that it's also a nice modeling paradigm for, for rotating convection as well. Yeah. Well, why don't we uh, oh. thank you once more. And, uh,